point. Um, so just really quickly on me, before we jump into my, my awesome panelists, um, I appreciated everything that Mark was saying. I, Adam Alomar, hi. Um, I, um, I worked at, a, at an agency, I worked at Avenue A, which became Razorfish on now for about 10 years in the display world. And I was really sick of how opaque and um, sort of meaningless a lot of the buying was, was, was that I was doing. And so I ended up starting a, an agency trading desk in 2008, actually with a search marketer, the guy that built search marketing at Razorfish. Um, so it was kind of the perfect um, melding of a media display person and a search engine marketing person. And we were those change agents inside our organization, which I'm very, very proud of. Um, and it's inter interesting to see what a huge phenomenon it is now. Um, I think we just happened to capture it at the right time. But a lot of the things that Mark was talking about, about being data-driven, about understanding channel influence, those are all, I'm, all the right things. So I hope you guys are taking great notes. OK, sorry, personal, uh, just a little personal message. Do um, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Jason? Hi, Jason. Uh, is it on? Uh, Jason Limbach, uh, CEO, co-founder of Datapop. Uh, we've built a creative optimization technology that helps marketers generate and optimize the highest engaging ad for each potential consumer that they would engage with. We work with leading marketers and agencies, many of, of the folks in this room, to generate in some cases tens of thousands of unique ads and optimize the elements of those ads to, to drive better engagement with those end consumers. Uh, we'll talk, I'm sure, about examples, but my favorite recent one is work with a leading retailer uh, and they've used, like every leading retailer, free shipping, free returns, and all of their copy. And we help them determine not only by category of product, jewelry versus handbags versus uh, accessories, which ads resonate best, but even within those categories. And my favorite punchline out of that was that uh, for that retailer in jewelry, the ad that worked the best was, you deserve to sparkle. And this was a search ad, right? So this is text. And it didn't work just for branding, it worked to drive performance. The back-end ROI went through the roof with that ad. So that, just to the importance of creative and how, how, how much it matters, even within the limited te text uh, search box, I think is an exciting thing to be discussing today. Yeah, totally. Hey, I'm uh, Tony Minuto. I'm the creative director of Radio Face. Uh, we're an ad agency, really. Uh, half of us are famous comedians. Some of you must recognize me, I'm sure. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and uh, the other half are ad people, um, and by combining the two skill sets of uh, creative uh, ad people and famous comedian sensibilities, we create engaging and exciting advertising. That's my elevator pitch. Awesome. Uh, hello, my name is Heather Molina. I work at Resolution Media, which is a digital marketing agency within Omnicom. And uh, we have search roots. We started off as a search agency and have grown and evolved into a full tour de force of digital marketing and everything else. Um, so I can completely, uh, it resonated when both Rob, uh, well, when Rob was particularly talking about earlier today about how everything is changing right now and really at the core of it, the best people primed and ready to really push forward in this new age it are really the people with the search legacy behind them and where they've come from. Uh, and right now, uh, I am focused on building out a new product uh, that is in the agile marketing space. Um, it's the content continuum. It's the content marketing practice at Resolution Media. And we're focused on SEO, paid search, and really looking at the different dynamics at play and how we can get that near time results for clients and pumping out the right content at the right time with the right message. Hello, everybody. I'm Jason Steingold, uh, co-founder and VP of Brand Entertainment and Business Development at Engage BDR. We are a, we've launched various technologies. We have an ad network where we reach 200 million unique users per month with our display advertising. We've, we've launched our own RTB technology as well, and we've launched our own multimedia production studio, which I've spearheaded, where we produce branded content. We have a slate of programming that you know, we pitch out to brands, and we also create custom programming for brands. And, you know, across all platforms, we're actually in pre-production for um, TV content for China, as well as their, uh, you know, social media programming. So, that's me. Hey, I'm Shane Vaughn. I'm the uh, CMO of Ballyhoo, and I'm gonna, uh do something weird here. We're working on a, a new positioning statement, explain who we are. So I want to read it, which is why I have my iPad here. And I want to ask you guys after this to come up to me and tell me if this resonates with you. Does this explain who we are? Okay. 
Ballyhoo helps large national brands like Aflac or Wendy's, who have lots of local stores or agents, execute effective local marketing campaigns primarily through digital channels. Our software scales hundreds or thousands of unique local campaigns and ensures they're efficient, effective, and on-brand. So that's what we do. Please come tell me if that makes sense or doesn't make sense. I thought that made a lot of sense. Outstanding. <laughs> According to Forrester Research. Exactly, right, yeah. You're officially quoted. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah, I love this. We have such a good mix of uh, backgrounds and uh, current roles up here when it comes to creative content creation, uh, technology building, search engine marketing, display advertising, a uh, perfect group to talk about this stuff. Um, so I wanted to start by, and I'm, us I'm not checking like Facebook or anything, I actually have my questions on here. I wanted to start um, by just uh, mentioning um, at the very beginning, um, the Boo CTR fellow had a, had a great visual of the kind of like robot hand and the human hand. You know, and that's my favorite thing to talk about these days is how we make sure that we maintain some art and creativity in the marketing that we're doing amidst this just boom in terms of the technologies and the science that's available to us uh, to market. So that's really what I want to focus on today is this marriage of, of art and science. Um, so for anybody, because I don't like to make people go in order, how do you hyper-target advertising that is also hyper-relevant and meaningful. Somebody. <laughs> no, I mean, I was just going to jump right in. I think it really requires taking a look at the type of talent that you have to start with. Um, talking about infrastructure and what Mark was just talking about and how the big leaders are really focusing on how they're paying attention to the infrastructure and the, and the type of people that are actually building out within their companies. So for us, it really starts with analyzing the type of talent that we have and getting a sense of where the gaps are in terms of each of a cl each client's program, what are the most important things and goals, and taking a look at does this piece of ta does this talent does this person actually know more of the science or do they know more of the art? We're actually taking a look at how we're hiring people and saying that given the emergence of big data and everything that we have at the access at, at our you know that we can access at our fingertips and knowledge about a client and about a client's competitors, we need the right type of people who can analyze that data and also turn around and flip out the right content and creative to marry with it, whether it's on the SEO side, on the display side, or on the uh, website content SEO side as well. So for us, it's really looking at the type of talent because you can only go so far with the automation and being able to actually pull out and extract those details and those insights is extremely critical. And it takes technology, but at the core of it, it really takes taking a look at how how you have in place the right people. Okay, so I'm curious then, sorry, I just wanna, I'm gonna ask a follow-up question. How important is the, the sort of, you know, much lauded big idea in this world? And I'm gonna look at Shane for a second because, I mean, this is your business. Your business is hyper-local, I mean, thousands of campaigns. How, yeah, how much do you have to start with a big idea or can you just? Yeah, you know, I, and I, I came from the advertising industry and the search industry, and I think the big idea is important. I think that, I think that in this art and science discussion, um, we're in fear of losing our basic common sense here of understanding the consumer, right? I mean, um, you know, I think of a, of a search term, somebody looking for a big screen TV, and think about where that person lives in their customer life cycle. They're pretty early. We're not necessarily looking to convert that co customer, but if you think about that customer looking for big screen TV in Park City, Utah, he's just told us where he is, right? And as search marketers and as digital marketers, we tend to not really think about the, the actual intent of that consumer, right? We're looking to see yep. from a data standpoint how we drive them to conversion fastest and what's the segment we can push to conversion fastest without applying a level of common sense that says, how do I really actually give them what they want? Yeah, yeah I think that's yeah. A, a great point. I, you know, I think this, the notion of the big idea and actually it, it plays off a bit of what Mark was talking about, although I'd quibble with him, is that you can use search not only as demand generation, but as a research tool to really understand you have a big idea, you have micro ideas that you want to target within a, a particular category of products you're selling or services that you're offering. And you can use a lot of that intent-based uh, interaction, not only to drive demand, but also to try and understand what ideas are resonating with that consumer. That's why I brought up the, the example of you deserve to sparkle is that there's, so, there's something in that ad, and I think the Boost CTR crew had a, a couple of great examples as well that got beyond just driving sales. But in jewelry, instead of in bags, this notion of something personal, something that really connects with the end consumer, 
could resonate, and you can use that in your, your top of the funnel activities. You could use that in your, your, your catalogs. You can use it all the way up in your television ads. By the way, I think it's probably good for people to quibble with Mark. It probably keeps him honest. Yeah, where is this? <laughs> where is that guy? Um, if I can uh, interject here. I, I think when you start thinking about where you're interacting with consumers in that point of contact, um, and it, it could be traditional advertising or digital, whatever the space is, consumers are there not because they're usually looking for advertising. They're there because they want to either be exactly. entertained or find information. Absolutely. So whatever information that you're presenting or entertainment you're presenting better be good as good as the content that they're there to, whether it's radio, listen to, or TV watch. Um, so you know, uh, creating good content, I think, is equally as important. Yeah. Well, just uh, it's just an interesting point on that. It's it the content's incredibly important, but again, also the relevance is incredibly important, right? So yep. that's where the science. I mean, they could really be enjoying the content that they're looking at, but if that ad is the right thing at that moment, exactly, it might be enough. It might be enough to grab them. Go ahead, Jason. All right, yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, we work with Ask.com to create. We recreated the Jamie Kennedy experiment, and it lived on one of our web properties that we co-owned with Jamie Kennedy. And we worked really closely with Ask.com. Um, I mean, we actually, the, the actual web show didn't have any branding within there, but we worked very closely with them to create and produce three you know, branded pre-rolls for Ask.com starring Jamie that played, that ran before the content. So you know, we worked very closely with them to make sure the messaging was right for their audience, and they actually copycatted some, you know, one of our um, commercials that we wrote and produced and created a, a commercial <laughs> for television from that ad. But, um, you know, and then we, you know, we ran those ads, we ran those pre-rolls and web content across our ad network, you know, targeted to their specific demographic that they wanted to reach. And, you know, we can use different data service providers that we're partnered with to, to hyper-target their audience as well. Did it work? It worked very well. <laughs> That's good. I think one of the other things you have to be careful about from a data standpoint is data measures what you tell it to measure, right? And Totally. And I'm thinking about, you know, for example, from our world is, is we have Aflac, this national brand, 70,000 Aflac agents. We run digital campaign for them. We run digital campaigns for several thousand colder plumbers. And and what you find is conversion at the local level, converting with a local agent or a local plumber or a local um, home remodeler, 70% of the time that happens via the phone, right? People are picking up the phone to call these guys, which is fascinating in something that as a national digital marketer, we wouldn't even necessarily consider to think of, to focus on, to put in our data measurement capabilities. If you're not running unique tracking phone numbers there, you would have no idea the significance of that. So that's the other trap you have to be careful in. Um, Heather, you actually t touched on this a little bit, and I'm curious okay, for sorry. <laughs> it's, you know, it's perfect. Other for second Jason, first Jason, second Jason, and for Tony, I feel like this is really relevant for you guys. How much science and math should content producers understand? And the answer could be none, or the answer could be lots. I'm curious. I mean, as it pertains to our business, because we're kind of you know we have the the multimedia studio, but we also have the technologies in place to implement. Um, you know, distribution for those, um, for that content. So I think it's very important, especially when we're working with brands. You know, it's not, we create the, the greatest piece of content and no one will ever see it. So there, the big question is always, that eventually comes up is, how many people are gonna see this? You know, how can we get this out there? So, you know, we have to implement different strategies, you know, with our, utilizing our, our advertising network and then also, you know, different types of viral seeding, driving YouTube views to, you know, back into their goals. But are the, so are they fundamentally different people? You know, like is the person that's creating the content sitting next to the person that understands the technology? Tony and then Heather. You know, I, I mean, I, I think that when we're working on a campaign, the first thing that we do is find out who's gonna buy the product and, and research the death out of that and do focus groups. I mean, it's. It's a horrible word in the creative world. Focus Classic group. stuff, right? But it, it's huge. You know, I don't like focus grouping work necessarily um, because you, you never know. You'd have to do a, a huge sampling. But we, we find out what the product's about, who's going to buy it, and that's where we start. Uh, but the thing that you never want to forget is that you're actually talking. The end user is a person. I mean, you're at a... I always use the analogy that I'm at a party, and um, 
I'm trying to engage people with a message and uh, how I approach them and how I'm talking about it and whether it's working or not. And it, I think it really comes down to that. The Boost um, guy, I forget his name. Uh, I'll call him the Boost guy. Um, That's what we've all been calling him. Sorry, Boost guy. He showed that certificate ad and said that one of the, the most effective ones was the one that connected on an emotional level. And I think that's really true. You know, laughing is an emotion. Um, you're reacting to something. You're surprised by it. And uh, in the world that we're in right now, the moment of contact is very short. It's instantaneous. It's quick. It, you know, it's analogous to driving at 80 miles an hour and seeing a billboard go by. So whatever your opening line is better be really good at that party or that bar situation. Um, you know, I always think of, of a movie uh, you know, th or the opening of a book, and if a book was um, Kevin took off his pants, or <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily think that was a great. <laughs> I'm pretty story. sure I watched that next party. Uh, I might read that book, <laughs> um, but uh, the f the first line of the movie, uh, "Stand by Me," is uh, I was 12, maybe 13, uh, when I first saw my first dead human being, and you're like, oh, I want to watch that movie. So um, I'm always a big believer in that, whatever the opening is. Uh, we worked on a Fiat campaign um, when they reintroduced the brand here last year, and we used uh, storytellers. And, story and it was a primarily radio-driven campaign, and storytelling works really good on radio. Um, and the opening of our spots could have been, it could have been Fiat Presents, the Fiat Storytelling Series. Um, and that would have put me to sleep. The opening of our spots were things like, and they were recorded live, uh, storytellers saying things like, uh, I jumped out of the plane at 40,000 feet. When I turned around, the instructor looked at me and said, wait, you're shoot. And that's the beginning of a commercial, and people really were pulled into that, and then a strong drive to online at the end of that. Um, that's my story. Yep. Just one quick point on the, the people side. So yeah, I think it goes both ways. I think on the art side, people have to get more scientific in how they think about how they're telling their stories, which tell stories are resonating. I think a good example is probably a comedian, right? They work their bit at, in smaller venues first. They get the feedback. They, they adjust on the fly. And that's data, right? They're using to, to understand are the, is their message hitting. But, I, you know, the story on the other side is the big data guys that I work with, those, the, the ones that are really effective, that really drive value for the end marketers, are the ones that don't just think in data, but they think in stories. Sure. What stories are we trying to get out of this data? And so I think the worlds have to come together, yeah. and, the, and the, the skill sets have to, to, to merge to some extent. One quick comment, and then Heather, I, I say you. Um, I, the, a thing that I talk a lot about at Forrester um, when I talk to interactive marketers um, and also to publishers that sell to them is your biggest problem is the way that you're organized as a company right now and that you're not necessarily set up for all those people to communicate. People aren't necessarily incented to communicate. They're not necessarily incented to work together. I know that's kind of depressing, but hopefully, you know, the end result is they go, oh, geez, we got to fix that because our consumers don't care that we run a search campaign and a display campaign and a print campaign. Everything is connected now. And yeah. I mean, in my personal life, I also teach Bikram yoga. It's the hot yoga. And I studied for about two months with this 65-year-old Indian guy who said a lot of just random and weird things um, to be able to teach this yoga in my spare time. And one of the things that he said to me that I didn't get when he said it at the time, but over time I've gotten is he said that the darkest place is underneath the lamp. It's directly underneath the lamp where you're just focused. You're not paying attention to everything else that's just sort of acting as a satellite or out there beyond it. So in the search world, a lot of times over the last 10 years that I've been in this business, we've just been focusing what's directly in front of us, the data that we have. We're not thinking about everything else that's out there. And that's why you're starting to see now, uh, or I'm happy to see now, that there is this, this convergence of everything coming together and taking a look and having more people, you know, maybe with the journalism background, maybe with the creative writing background, who are coming into this business and able to provide that, ans uh, that insight. You asked, you know, what, what, how much, you know, how much of art and science do we are, does the talent need to have in order to execute and actually be able to, to effectively uh, run these marketing campaigns for brands? And, and, you know, as I said earlier, it's going to be different on a brand by brand basis. But the important thing to know is to, in order to operate in an agile space, you need to have both. And it's going to depend largely on the type of product, the type of business, and how the client side is set up as well. But it, with internally within organizations, especially digital marketing agencies, you need to have them sitting side by side, 
they need to be in constant communication and they need to be looking beyond just what's directly underneath the lamp. Right, totally. I mean, it's sort of a good segue into my next question, which is, so, you know, I worked at an agency. We, we were excited about programmatic buying and I'm starting to see, you know, agencies hiring people with biology degrees, with math degrees, people that are coming out of um, finance jobs. And so I, I'm, I wonder about kind of this question, and this is something one of you guys asked me on the prep call. I thought we should discuss it. How do we make what is essentially day trading more about marketing and relevant consumer experiences? You know, as we're moving to a more programmatic, automated, data-driven world of media buying and optimization. Yeah, I'll, ta I'll take a cut at Please. it. I I think that's that, that notion of day trading, if you think about the last 15 years of innovation and in online advertising, all of the heat has been on commoditizing the consumer and pricing that consumer in a hyper-efficient way. Important stuff, right? But it is more like day trading than it is marketing in some respects. And so I think what, what has been lost over the past 15 years is that the most important part of the marketing equation is what do you have as a marketer that deserves the attention of the end consumer? And so a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that's been laid down on, on the infrastructure side in, in online marketing is, has lost that, I think. And, and so you know, the big thing for, for me and I think for all of us in this room as we think about it is we're consumers as well. And we know that our bar for at our attention has only gotten higher. I agree. And our options for where we spend that attention is only increasing. So if you get in front of me with an ad today versus a year from now, next year it's gonna be harder to get my attention because I'm gonna be spending my, my attention in other spots. And I think to, to the earlier points around content, ads as content, I think addresses that. But if we don't shift our focus and really start to come back to the most important part, which is what do you have to show that consumer that deserves their attention, I think we're gonna be in. I love that phrase. You know, what, it, yeah. like, what do you have as a marketer that, yeah. you know, that deserves the consumer's attention? You guys, sorry, go ahead, conversation. No, I think you know. I think you made an interesting point about companies, you know, hiring biology and math and finance majors, right? Yeah. And from my perspective, and I'm, I'm I'm a software guy, so by nature, this is where I go. But from my perspective, man, let the technology handle that stuff, right? I mean, frankly, the type of people that I want to hire in are psychology majors, right? Yep. I want people who Great. really understand how people think and why they Great. behave the way they do, and I want to have technology <laughs> manage the push and the pull of the big data. Yeah, I think the problem for the agency is is that the technology companies are eating their lunch as a result because right, they actually <laughs> have trying those to find <laughs> a way to keep it all <laughs> in house. Skills. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. No, I mean I was just going to add to that that yeah, I think that looking at people with that you know, that social behavioral science kind of background is definitely going to be what helps drive, you know, forward everything. I mean, it's what I've been hitting on all along, but you know, to think about day trading and programmatic buying and how everything is becoming automated, um, you know, it's 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 absolutely helpful. I think that what we've built out with um, with our own DMP uh, within Omnicom is evolving from what it was a year ago into what it's becoming today and how it's merging with what we're doing on the search side and everything else digital. Um, and it's having those right people in place. And, and some of those people are people with very eclectic backgrounds that you wouldn't see. I think the data is becoming easier to read and, and interpret. So it opens up a lot more freedom to find that relevancy and the way to connect that message to the right consumer. But I'm sure, so I'm sure though, the, the flip side of that is that we've all experienced, or some of us who are in the kind of programmatic world have experienced campaigns where we have hyper-segmentation, but we have one piece of creative to use, yeah. which basically kills the whole point, yep. right? Yeah. It's crazy. You see that over and over again, though, just thousands of micro-segments and a couple creatives. Yeah. So why? Why? What's the problem? Does the client not understand? No. <laughs> oh no. The client. I think the client knows they want to do it. Okay. It's just they don't then have what's the, the tools issue? To, to really focus their energies on the, the creative side of the equation at scale, right? Which is the, I think the big challenge. If I have, key, keywords is a great example. If I have a million keywords in my search campaign, I have potentially hundreds of thousands of unique segments of consumers that I can talk to. The tools up until recently have only been about how do you pay for that consumer not how do you engage that consumer base of, based on what you have to, that deserves their attention. Yeah. And so I think it's a, it's a timing thing. I think as the tools uh, light up, um, what a marker can do at that scale, then these guys are gonna tear it up. I mean, they, Like they DCO technology and display, yeah. dynamic and, creative and optimization. Data pop. Data pop. Search. Sorry, Jason and then Tony. 
I mean, I guess it's sometimes they understand, sometimes they don't. Maybe it's the most optimized creative that they've tested recently right. they that they're using. That's it. Yeah, or maybe you know you have to help them and explain to them, hey, we want to test A B test, you know, various creatives and find the best performing creative that's going to reach your audience most effectively. I think it's about uh, limited resources. I think you have, it's easier to, you know, you have a marketing budget, okay, that's where you start, and uh, where am I going to spend my money? And it used to be, okay, we're doing traditional advertising, we're going to do a TV campaign, and it's going to cost me a million dollars. And the creative team would go away, and they'd work for two weeks working on a TV campaign. Now you've got six different targeted campaigns. And whether it's just a, a, a pre-roll video that you're doing on a targeted website, uh, that takes the same amount of effort from a creative point of view that that one TV campaign does. So now you're multiplying your workload by six. And um, I think there's value in that, but uh, we're trying to, I think, and this is the kind of the point of this whole discussion, I think, is wrestling with, we've got these great tools, and all of a sudden there's another side of the equation that we're trying to catch up with. And that is, s there needs to be somebody at whatever company, um, and I guess at my company I'm the person, but figuring out <laughs> how, to you, Tony. how to, yeah, too many hats, but you figuring out how to spend the money and wh where to spend it and where's the lowest hanging fruit um, and who to go after and, um, uh, you know, like that. So, so we're working on a campaign right now for dot, dot me, which is an alternate for dot com, and we've uh, uh, targeted our four end users and then one base target. And if the client has enough money, <laughs> if they have an extra million dollars, we're going to do a huge national radio or pre-roll campaign, video campaign. But if they don't have that money, we're doing four very highly targeted things even like small events in cities to give away prizes, uh, that micro focus. But all of that at thinking takes an enormous out of energy. So we're almost out of time, which is such a bummer, because um, there's five of you, and you all have good things to say. So I'm going to ask you one last question for all of us to discuss, and then I'm going to ask you guys each to give like one brief piece of advice to the audience. Nothing scary, I promise. Um, so I've been thinking lately about this. Um, uh, my, my world is paid um, advertising, you know, so display advertising, search, pre-roll. Um, but there's a lot of talk these days of native advertising, which, yes, is still paid, but it's not so standardized as the stuff that I've been looking at. And then there's content marketing, right? So it feels to me like there's this um, growing continuum. Maybe it's always been there, but I've been thinking about this continuum of kind of content marketing to native advertising to just plain standardized advertising. And I'm curious what you guys think is happening there and how that continuum will change. Like, does paid advertising go away? Why or why not? Good, I don't think so either, but I want to hear it from you guys. So, go. But if I was going to write a blog post, it would say traditional advertising is dead. Right, because <laughs> that's a good headline. Um, yeah, right. Good no, for all of us. Yeah, I know, right. Of course, it's not dying. I mean, you know, right. But I, but I think that I think that we as marketers are, you know, it's a little bit back to that that art and science element, right? We're we're realizing that that bringing art and and really, frankly, providing true value into to the consumers of of our of our messages, right, is is the critical element of what we do, right? I mean, the, the advertising world came about 50 years ago and it was a novel idea that, and, and it was actually provided value. It was communicating new products to people that, that they didn't have a way to find out about otherwise, right? We're past that now and now we need to be able to provide more value. I was looking for a big screen TV the other day and could not find a, a manufacturer that produced a good document on the difference between LCD versus versus all the different other kinds of, of big screen TVs that you can buy. And I thought, God, they're missing such an opportunity from a content perspective. I mean, I'm hungry, educate me, right? right. Um, but then in the meantime, also serve the remarketing ad to you after you visit their website. Yeah, uh, yeah, right, exactly, exactly. So I think, I th I think it's shifting, uh, nothing's dying, so nothing ever dies. Who else? Nothing ever just dies. <laughs> that's why there's still yellow pages. Oh, okay, no, I was just gonna say, I mean, this is why you're starting to see more and more agencies 
uh, start to evolve how they're set up. I mean, we, we're doing it, a couple of other agencies are out there, it's that digital newsroom approach where you're taking a look at everything that's happening across news feeds, across uh, competitors, across um, social and everything else and trying to find the best tactic at a given moment to actually push out across social, across the paid, across anything owned, whether it be SEO or content creation. And you're starting to see people or agencies start to evolve how they're approaching that. Um, and you know that that's part of the reason why we, we started to call this the content continuum at resolution. It's really taking a look at content and how it's going to breed across that paid, owned, and earned space and what it's going to what exactly what it's going to do and how it can uh, constantly evolve and change and shift. How big is that department? I'm curious. <laughs> it's very small right Two now. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it's it's you know it's in its it's in, in, in its infant stages, but it's not going to just be you know one person pushing out the thought leadership, which is me, it involves everybody across the team. So it's not, it's a digital newsroom approach. Mm -hmm. It's a process. It's not exactly, it's not more of a, a team and a, uh, it's a team effort, but it's a process and an approach and a philosophy change. Yeah, I mean, I, it, Mark was talking about how you gather the, gather the change agents, yep. gather the folks together, yep. you know, that are most excited about change. It's the most effective way it's going yeah. to work. Yeah, and then it starts to disseminate and become kind of, um, something you find on the ground. Okay, anybody else on that before we close? Because I think we're, where's Lori? I think we're pretty much out of time, right? Okay, final thought, like 30 seconds. Okay, I'll be fast. Piece of advice. PPT, it's all about PPT. So people process technology, we sort of hit on this throughout the panel, but all three of those things have to come together to make art and science scale to, to the opportunity that we all have in front of us. We have uh, a white paper that we handed out that gets to the, the process side, the people side, because I think that's critical, and Mark hit on that earlier in his session. You gotta start with process and alignment across the teams, and then the technology becomes an enabler. So I would, I would focus on that side of the equation first, the process side, before you get into what tools and where. Yeah, the t tech is enabler. Yeah, totally. Tony? Um, let's see, this is just a purely like creative thought, I guess. Think about your context. Context is really important. Context is what makes things uh, stand out. So, um, and this is crazy. My daughter has a Barbie book. She's four. And in the Barbie book, there are different Barbie dolls, Ken and Barbie, and they're all positioned as if they're at parties. And uh, it's fine for a four-year-old reading this book. But if, had I taken one of those pictures, which I'm going to do, and blow it up and put it on a poster in my wall, in my office, it's suddenly ironic. Um, and hilarious. So uh, just think about where you where and a little weird, frankly. <laughs> and yeah, a little, little weird, weird. Little weird. And a little weird. Uh, I told you it was weird. Uh, just think about context. I think that's really important. Um, and because um, if you can do something strange in a certain context, it's surprising, and consumers will take notice. My only advice is if your agency or your vendor is not coming to you and challenging you with new ideas around real time and agile marketing, um, they're not doing their job. And if they're not producing Amen. thought leadership and pushing that out to you, they're really failing to miss the mark of where everything is going. And well, that's one of the things that we really pride ourselves on at Resolution Media is pumping out this thought leadership and really starting to take a look at how things are evolving and exactly where we need to be going and constantly encouraging our clients to test and be fearless yep. in content. So <laughs> we, um, as a content creator and working with, uh, you know, working really closely with agencies and brands, you know, just, you know, it's kind of... Um, it's a juggling act working with, you know, these filmmakers in Hollywood that, you know, they have, they want to produce things and, you know, they want to shun the studios and shun the networks, build their own communities online. And, you know, but they want brands to come in and fund them, which is, you know, how we kind of come into the equation as well. So it's kind of, you know, um, kind of being a mediator, working with the brands, finding out exactly what their, their messaging, it, messaging is, and you know, working with the filmmakers, and you know, make them understand that you know the brands you know want to be kind of uniquely and, and virally integrated into their their content, and then you know, once that happens, and it's it could be a beautiful thing. So so that's kind of cool. It's like this mediation layer between brand advertising and concept design and content creation. Right. Exactly. I mean, you <laughs> you 
couldn't imagine some of the arguments that I had. I mean, not arguments, but heated conversations with the, the content creators that we work with because, you know, they have their, you know, they're trying to keep their integrity, you know, or what they see is their integrity. And then, you know, the agency guy on this side saying, no, we need to do this, you know, is, is granular as, you know, one of, you know, someone in the content, you know, changing their shirt that has a Beastie Boys logo on it, you know. He doesn't understand why in you know a, a online piece of content he can't have a Beastie Boys shirt on, but the you know the brand is saying hey we need to you know respect the uh, we <laughs> sorry. Um, well yeah, I mean it's literally like brand wants what brand wants. Yeah, exactly. Content creator wants what content creator wants. Yeah. Right. I think so well, we could probably spend a day talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Shane. I have a Beastie Boys shirt on under. <laughs> Yay! Um, I think that you know my my piece of advice is creative segmentation really works. Um, find ways to do it. If you have a hundred segments but you can't do anything about that creatively, then it's worthless to you. My for my work, use technology. I think local is a great way to segment creative, and if you do it, you'll see cost per conversions cut in half, uh, typically from your national efforts. Thank you guys so much. Uh, do we have time for questions? Or are we totally out of time? Yeah. No, out of time. Yeah. Wah, wah. I will be at the airport. But I'm just the moderator. These guys will be. Cool. Thank you guys so much. Great. Thank you guys.